What's up, friends? Welcome back to the Dr. Joey Munoz Show. Today, I had a conversation with an old friend of mine who actually did his PhD alongside me at Florida State University, Dr. Chester Sokolowski. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. I've been practicing it now, so I wouldn't screw it up. Um, Chester completed his PhD in exercise physiology, and he also has a wide breadth of knowledge when it comes to specific topics around strength, biomechanics, building muscle. He's taught a number of both undergraduate and graduate level courses as well. And he is an avid bodybuilder. Chester's one of the biggest guys I know. (laughs) Uh, Definitely my most muscular friend by far. And so in this conversation, we talked about some more advanced topics related to hypertrophy training, We talked a ton about volume. Chester actually trains with very low volume, does one to four sets per muscle per week. And he explained his rationale as to why he does so and why he thinks that the current state of the literature, scientific literature, recommending 10 plus sets per muscle per week, perhaps um, isn't as accurate as we think it is. So if you guys are interested in learning more about advanced hypertrophy training topics, Make sure to listen to the whole episode. I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get into it, as I say pretty much every single episode, I would greatly appreciate if you took a second to uh, leave a review and rate the podcast. If I get some good ratings and I get more ratings from you guys, it helps me a ton to continue growing the podcast and push my content to more people. So if you do enjoy listening to these episodes, all I ask is to please take a second and just leave a rating. I appreciate you guys, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Chester, what's up, my man? Hope you're doing well, dude. Thank you for taking some time um, to speak with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Awesome, dude. Well, um, you put out some great content on social media, bro. Actually, you started doing the social media stuff way before I did, right? We were still kind of in school, and you were putting out some posts about hypertrophy training and you've gained some really good traction, man. So I wanted to really center this conversation around hypertrophy training. Most of the people that listen to the podcast are general population people who are trying to improve their health, but want to build some muscle and look juicy, right? So I think we'll be able to um, provide perhaps some more nuance and talk about some more advanced topics here. Because I've recorded a couple podcasts in the past talking about like general principles of hypertrophy training, very, very basic. But I'm excited to hear from you because you obviously have a lot more expertise in this than I do. Um, So how about you you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background, why you're qualified to talk about this, and then we'll get into the topic. Okay. Well, my name is Dr. Chester Sokolowski. I have a PhD from Florida State. Um, That's how Joe and I met each other at Florida State University. Um, My PhD is in exercise physiology. Before Florida State, I was at the University of Georgia, and I have taught eight academic courses, including neuromuscular physiology, biomechanics, exercise physiology, and the principles of strength and conditioning. So I have quite a academic extensive background that has prepared me to study muscles at the most in-depth level, um, as well as I'm a meathead, you know, certified meathead bodybuilder. I've been training since I was, I don't know, like 16, but ever since I was like five years old, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. You know, I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was like, wow, I want to look like that one day. Yeah. Um, So this has been my passion ever since I was young and I continued all through school. Yeah, so this this podcast goes on YouTube with the video, and I'm sure people who are seeing you can tell you're a jacked dude. <laughs> for those of for those of you listening, Chester's massive. I remember, dude, the first time I saw you in graduate school, and you walked in, I was like, "Oh my god, who is that guy?" <laughs> so you obviously um, have the educational background, but the pa- practical experience too, because you've uh, competed in bodybuilding. You've been training for for what 12, 13 years now. Yeah, over a decade. I've never actually competed. I've gotten yeah. down. I know I've gotten down super lean, and I've I've gotten to two point nine percent body fat on a DEXA, um, which is like grotesquely lean. Yeah, but I saw myself, and I was like, you know, the body dysmorphia is kicking in. Like I'm not big enough. Um, I'm not there. Uh, so I never stepped on stage, but Dude. I have shredded down to, you know, veins in my glutes. Like it. It's That's mind blowing. I definitely thought you've competed before. Nope, never have, never have. One day, I got to get bigger, you know, what we all say. Dude, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> I got to get bigger, man. Um, but yeah, I think it would be a really cool experience for you to try to step on stage and, and show off what you've been working so hard on, man. Because 
bro, you obviously have a really impressive physique. Um, and I'm sure people will check you out on social media after this. I'm, I'm sure you would do very, very well. But yeah, man, let's go ahead and talk about the, the main thing we want to talk about here, which is hypertrophy training specifically. What are perhaps some of uh, some common thought processes when it comes to hypertrophy training that you don't think are fully accurate? And then we'll talk about why those things are right. And I know there's a number of things, volume, um, perhaps intensity, which is associated with volume, uh, the idea of stretch media hypertrophy for some specific exercises. We can really start with any of those. What are your thoughts? I think we should just start with intensity. So yeah. let's define intensity because a lot of people, uh, they can, can confuse it with effort. So intensity is how heavy you lift. You know, it's a percent of your 1RM. Now, you don't have to know what your 1RM is. I've never done a 1RM test since high school, mm -hmm. you know, on my squat or bench. But as long as you're lifting a relatively challenging weight, and what I consider a challenging weight is you can reach muscular failure in about 16 or fewer reps. Mm -hmm. um, because that's when you pick a weight up and you're going to have a, a, what they call a high motor recruitment. You're going to engage a lot of your muscle right at the start of lifting. Um, and if you recruit the muscle, it really increases the likelihood you can strain the muscle and then eventually grow the muscle. So, you know, you got to lift heavy enough to engage the muscle and then take that set um, relatively close to failure to, to generate that force induced strain. So I think intensity is key. Um, that's what separates work resistance training from the other modes of exercise is how heavy you lift is the mechanical tension on the muscle. You know, it's not the metabolic stress. Um, you can feel a burn pretty much doing any form of exercise. You know, you can go swimming, you can walk on an inclined treadmill, you can get a great burn doing those things, but they're not going to grow muscle. Uh, it's not oxidative stress. Um, it's, it's the mechanical stress, the, the tension, uh, how heavy you lift. So whenever you do, it starts with tension. It starts with intensity. Um, it's not going to get confused with effort, which is essentially how difficult something feels. So yeah. For example, you could train pretty heavy and it feels difficult as high intensity and high effort. You can also give high effort. You know, you're supersetting everything going back to back to back to back. But that's low intensity. It's a, it's a relatively light weight. And that might not be an ideal. I'm not going to use the word optimal a lot. Everyone mm -hmm. uses optimal. But that might not be an ideal resistance training stimulus. You know, just because something is extremely effortful or taxing doesn't mean it has intensity. And remember, intensity has that tension. And that's the key ingredient you need to stimulate the muscle growth. So whatever your program is, there's, there's many different approaches, but yeah. there has to be a certain level of intensity um, that is absolutely paramount. Otherwise, you're not going to see the adaptations you're trying to see when you're resistance training, you're not going to grow the muscle, you're not going to make the gains. Yeah. Yeah, I love that you define intensity in that fashion because it does often get confused with effort, right? And I, I can see why, because oftentimes we also define intensity as proximity to failure, which is related but slightly different, right? And I love that you brought up the idea of using an intensity that is high enough to where you reach near muscular failure at most around that 15 rep mark, right? And I guess this is one of the main things that we can talk about is that Everybody talks about different rep ranges being equally effective for hypertrophy, whether you're training in the 5 to 10 rep range, 10 to 15, or going beyond that, maybe even close to 30 reps, right? And I understand that the research that we have available currently perhaps shows that. But from a practical standpoint, I've never trained above 15 reps. Uh, I find that it becomes incredibly difficult to stay focused and to actually push near failure when you're going for 20 or 25 reps, right? What are your thoughts on that? I agree a hundred percent with that. Um, uh, it starts about, again, about that motor recruitment. So if you lift about 60% of your one RM and that's where I get the 15, 16 reps mm -hmm. from, then you can engage a lot of muscle. If you go light, right at this, pretty much right at the start of the set, you can pick the weight up and you're going to recruit, you know, type one, type two fibers. You're going to lift a, a healthy enough weight to recruit a heavy chunk of muscle. If you go lighter than that, then you're going to, you know, say 30 reps is, is mm -hmm. potentially near failure. You're going to recruit your type one muscles at the start of the set. And then you have to get near failure to recruit those type two muscles. So if you're doing really high reps, your gains may be limited by your pain threshold. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's an ideal way to lift, you know, essentially don't create this limitation and make your muscular growth dependent on how much you can tolerate from a pain standpoint, how much of the burn you can tolerate. And I think what's also so important to realize in those really high rep studies is if you ever look at the exercise selection, they're doing quad extensions. Mm -hmm. They're not doing squats. They're not doing deadlifts. They're not doing yeah. bench press. They're doing a relatively easier isolation, single joint movement. They're not doing a multi-joint movement where 
the aerobic capacity can become a factor. You know, if you do anything over 10 on squats, it feels like your lungs are going to explode. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if you're doing the quad extensions, it's so much easier versus some of these exercises and practicality, even, you know, rows or lap pushdowns like those are demanding. And if you're going over, you know, 15 reps, your aerobic conditioning, how, how in shape you are, that might also limit your muscle growth and, and as well as your pain capacity, your pain tolerance. Yeah, it's funny because I see it with clients that I work with all the time where I always ask for video feedback of their training to gauge intensity or proximity to failure, right? And that pain threshold, first off, it's it's something that you learn, right? Because when you first start training, like m most things hurt, even if you're at like five or six RIR reps in reserve or reps shy of failure for those that don't understand what RIR is. It hurts, right? Like training hurts. And one of the things that I like to, to teach my clients about is when they're reviewing footage, look at the speed of your repetitions. If they don't substantially slow down towards the end, even though you're intentionally trying to flex your muscles as hard as possible, then you're not really getting to the level of intensity or effort that is required, right? And oftentimes it is harder to learn how to do that with higher reps. Like 15 reps is relatively high. 15 reps is hard to get to failure, at least for me personally, on many exercises. Like you just mentioned compound movements, but even things like isolation movements, dude, like especially if you're trying to control eccentrics, get a slight pause in the stretch position, 15 reps on a leg extension, it's hell. Like it's really hard, <laughs> right? So yeah. do you think there's some practical recommendations there um, or some, some benefit for people to lean towards lower rep ranges to perhaps even learn how to push the effort in the first place. Yeah, I think that what I recommend, and I have a hypertrophy course and I talk about this, but I recommend sort of the four to 16 rep range. Mm -hmm. If you get under four reps, there's another component that is essential to grow and it's volume. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as important as intensity. I think there's, you know, A, intensity, B, volume. But if you're doing, you know, a set of one or a set of two or a set of three singles, doubles or triples, yeah. um, it's hard to rack up sufficient volume to, totally. to accumulate enough force induced strain. And also those sets are just brutal. I mean, they're so taxing. They're taxing on the joints, yeah. um, taxing on the mind. Those are extremely stressful sets. Um, so I think starting at four reps, that would be pretty good. And then again, that cap out is about 16. And, and that's based on a motor recruitment perspective where you can grow muscle and your gains are not going to be dependent on your aerobic capacity or your pain threshold. So I think striving to get stronger in the four to 16 rep range is good. And if you want to simplify it, my training personally, I like the six to 12 rep range. As, as old school as that sound, you know, all oh, hypertrophy you know, strength is one to five and, and hypertrophy is six to 12. I love the six to 12 rep range yeah. across the history of, um, you know, bodybuilding, the strongest, most aesthetic, best physiques have been people who can, get really strong across that six to 12 rep range. And I think that there are certain movements, you know, isolation movements where six reps is not appropriate because it's so taxing on your joints, like a dumbbell lateral raise or an overhead tricep yeah. extension. That would just be brutal at the six rep range. Um, so maybe you go a little bit higher on those isolations and maybe a little bit lower on the compounds. And that might also be conducive to your aerobic capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and how in shape you are. So a set of squats at 12 reps, not exactly fun. They might gear those a little lower, you know, eight reps, six reps, four reps, somewhere around there. And your isolations are a little bit higher. Um, yeah. But, Sorry, go ahead. I think you're about to say It's just much easier uh, on the joints. You know, you got to consider this whole thing as a marathon as well. You're not mm -hmm. going to change your body in a week or, or a month. This is a whole lifetime of, of a fitness lifestyle and having healthy joints throughout it makes lifting more fun, but it also it's going to give you better results because you can do some of the more growth promoting exercises. For example, your overhead tricep extensions. We have uh, great documented evidence that says the triceps are going to get a little bit better stretch when you have the shoulder flexions, when you have your arms overhead. Um, so therefore, preserving your elbow health long term throughout your lifting career. Very important. And that might be really difficult if you're trying to push overhead yeah. reps at the five to six rep range. It's, it's brutal. Yeah, I typically find that anything below eight reps for isolation movements is really difficult on the joint. And two, it's also difficult to establish really good mind-muscle connection, which I really enjoy on isolation movements specifically, right? Because I, th I think you can argue that if you're doing a heavy set of four or five on a squat, you probably also don't get like the best mind-muscle connection with your quads, right? But 
you definitely feel the work in the legs. Whereas, I mean, I guess I haven't done often a set of four or five on a bicep curl, but it's just really hard on focusing on the bicep working specifically if you're trying to go that heavy, right? And then oftentimes people are going to swing weights and at that point just might as well pick up something lighter, right? And so a question I had for you here regarding rep ranges, because I follow a very similar philosophy to you. Like actually very recently, I started doing some slightly higher rep ranges than I typically do. And that just means I'm doing 12 to 15 on some isolation movements because I usually don't go beyond 12 reps because for me personally, I think, I think I have ADHD. I don't know, but (laughs) it's so easy to lose focus, man. And for people who have been training for a while, you'll understand this. And for those that haven't, it's a learned skill, but focus is focus and intent is really important when you train, right? Especially when you're trying to push the intensity or trying to push effort, getting near failure. And when you're trying to do things with really good technique, not letting your technique break down, make sure you always get full range of motion on every repetition. Make sure you're controlling eccentrics, really emphasizing this stretch position. It's a lot to think about every single repetition, right? And trust me, when you're really trying to train hard, you really do focus on every repetition. And it's so mentally exhausting when you get to like 14, 15 reps. And even that small difference of like doing leg extensions to 14 or 15 reps versus 10 to 12, I don't think I can push as well in that higher rep range, man. Um, But anyways, the question I was going to ask, (laughs) which I went totally uh, in a different direction here is, I follow the same philosophy, right? I always start with my compound movements in a lower rep range. And then I always do my isolation movements after that in a higher rep range. Do you think there is there are gains that are being left in the table by always doing similar rep ranges on similar exercises? Or do you think it's perfectly fine? AKA, like if I always do squats in the six to eight rep range, would there be a benefit of me taking periods of times where I train the squat in higher rep ranges? I like a little bit of diversity, to be honest. We have different types of muscle fibers. We have type 1, we have type 2A, and we have type 2X. So I think a little bit of diversity. Now, it should be noted that your type 2 are much more sensitive to respond to hypertrophy. And these are the the fibers are going to be recruited when you're lifting a little bit heavier. Um, So, you know, not your sets of 25, not your sets of 30. Um, Mm -hmm. But I would definitely try to, to have a little bit of variety to hit all those fiber types, your type. Uh, 2A in your type 2X primarily, and then also your type 1. Um, but I would say instead of, you know, repeating always do the 6 to 8 rep range, I, I do squats myself, um, and I have sort of, you know, week A, week B, and week C. And then week A, I'll be at the 12 rep range. Week B, I'll be at the 8 rep range. And week C, um, I'll be at about the 6 rep range, sometimes 4 on the compound movements, getting a little bit lower. But a little bit of diversity to stress those different muscle mm-hmm. fibers. And also what I love to do that I don't see a lot of people do, um, it's called the drop set. And essentially, I would never do it on squats or something like that. But on quad extensions, let's say you're shooting for a set of 12. You get 12 or you get really close to 12, you know, really, really close to that muscle failure. Uh, and then you immediately reduce the weight and then you continue lifting. That way you can hit those type 2 muscle fibers with that mm-hmm. set of 12. And then you can also hit those type one, those fatigue resistant muscle fibers with the drop set. And I feel like adding a drop set sort of as a finisher when you're very last set of training a muscle group, that is a great way to maximize hypertrophy. And I don't see a lot of programs uh, make use of drop sets. So I think a little bit of variety in your rep range is fabulous. And then I think having a finisher drop set to hit those type one fibers specifically, those fatigue resistant fibers, it's absolutely um, a game changer in terms of the results that you're going to see just a, a schmeckin of diversity. Don't overdo it because there's variety is just completely overblown, especially on social media. They're doing yeah. four times 20 of six different exercises every single week. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Um, but repeat the same exercises with a little bit of variety in those rep ranges and you're going to get great results. Yeah. See the way I've enjoyed training is typically I include different rep ranges within the, within the same workout. Right. And I like spanning the entire range where I typically start with something heavy, five to eight-ish. Secondary movement will typically be a compound movement that mimics the primary movement, but it's machine-based. And then in the eight to 12 rep range there, and then I do some isolations, probably 12 to 15. So pretty like standard style of training, I guess. But I do have exercises that I enjoy in a particular rep range. Like 
I never really do squats above like six because it just sucks, right? Now, I've always wondered, does that limit my potential for progress? I'm not sure. Because another reason why I do that is I really do enjoy training with a pretty controlled negative, probably two or three seconds. I'm 6'5". It takes forever to get down. I like to get a full dead stop at the bottom and then explode up. And dude, no joke, when I do five or six reps on a squat in particular in that fashion, my heart rate is through the roof. So sometimes I I program going like eight to 10. And when I do it, maybe it's because I don't give myself enough time to adapt, but I'm just like, this is not it. (laughs) This is not fun. It's, It's hard to even maintain, again, the focus and the technical integrity. The squat's something that's never felt really innate or or just natural to me. So it, it feels a little bit awkward. So I have to really focus on the technique. And yeah, that four to six rep range is really where I've enjoyed doing that. And then I'll do some deep leg press or some hack squat in like the eight to 12 rep range. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to, I was gonna say, I'll have to try, but I'll have to think about trying the same movement in, in slightly different rep ranges. And that really only happens for me with the squat because other movements I do like uh, switching up the rep ranges occasionally. So one thing to talk about here regarding maybe not intensity, but let's say effort. What are your thoughts on the whole idea of training, perhaps the majority of your training being like a three or a four, maybe even a five RIR relative to like a one or two RIR, right? Uh, I personally, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I personally enjoy training very near failure for the majority of my work. Um, I feel like if I stop at a three or four RIR, kind of wasting time. And it's also really difficult to gauge progress when you train at a three RIR or a four RIR. And I just, I I don't know. Uh, It just feels like if you do that suboptimal effort, like you require a ton more volume and I don't want to be in the gym way longer either, right? So there's a relationship there, obviously, between how hard you push, how much volume you can handle. But what are your thoughts there in terms of, RIR where the majority of your training should be? It depends on your goals. Um, I think for hypertrophy, you need force induced strains. You have to recruit the muscle and then you have to, you have to strain it. You have to deform it. The the Mm -hmm. force that you generate has to change the integrity of the cell. It's going to be cytoskeletal tension, we call it. And that might not be accomplished, especially if you lift light, keeping four reps in reserve. Um, training four reps shy of failure. So I think if your goal is to maximize hypertrophy, training closer to failure can be extremely beneficial. Now with that, if you're going near true failure, your volume is going to go down. Don't expect to do, you know, I don't know, 20 sets a week or something like that, training all of them super close to failure. That's just not a reality. Um, If your goal is strength, on the other hand, and you need to accumulate sufficient volume lifting heavy, then Mm -hmm. keeping a little bit more reps in reserve can be advantageous. You know, I wouldn't recommend doing one rep in reserve, you know, on squats if your goal is strength, because you're going to blow out your mind uh, and potentially blow out your body just with all that fatigue. Um, Trying to rack up a whole bunch of volume in RPE nine if your goal is strength. But if your goal is hypertrophy and you want to change rapidly, rapidly change the way you look, then don't be afraid to train close to failure. And I think another thing that can happen if you do train with three or four reps in reserve, if your goal is hypertrophy, if you misjudge that set, Mm -hmm. say I can get four reps in reserve, but maybe in reality you can get seven, you know, you you get a a, a whole bunch more reps then that set is, is junk. It's a warm up set. I tell you, I'll tell you a story. We were, um, we're in the basement, we're in the sandals basement training this one research participant. It was Alex and I, Uh, Alex is another research. Yeah. And we were trying to get this research participant to do a set of eight with two reps in reserve. Okay. Um, and he kept saying, yeah, this is, this is all I got. I can't do any more. But we're looking at his lifting velocity. Remember, if you get closer to true failure, your lifting velocity is going to slow down. And these reps were just flying. They were going so fast. He was in eight reps, and his speed was, was off yeah. the chart. Um, so we said, all right, Alex got and I faster as the reps went on. <laughs> yeah, Alex and I looked at each other like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take this protocol and we're just gonna kind of you know do away with it for a second. And we told the guy go to true failure, and he got twenty seven reps. <laughs> and he was supposed to. He was telling us he could only do two more. Yeah. So the thing is, I would almost encourage people one time do a low volume workout and go to failure to see what you're truly capable of, because mm-hmm. um, you don't want to underestimate yourself especially if you're thinking you're going to do three or four RIR and you're capable of so much more, 
you're going to leave one, you're going to leave gains on the table Two, you're going to just have to like Joe, like Dr. Munoz said, you're going to have to do a whole bunch of volume. You have to do a whole bunch of sets. You're going to be in the gym for five ever yeah. and you're not going to see the results you want to see. Yeah. So I think pushing some sets closer to failure, you know, I like what I like is, is pretty much one RIR in most of my sets mm -hmm. besides the super demanding taxing lifts like deadlifts or squats. I like a little bit more reps in reserve because if I take those to one RIR, I'm going to be blown out, you know, for the whole workout. Mm -hmm. But on some of the other, you know, the isolation exercises or, or maybe even, you know, the rows or the you know machine rows or, or chest press um, on a machine, I'm, I'm not afraid to go to one RIR. Uh, I'm going to work in sets and then couple that with a drop set. And then I can be done training a muscle group relatively quick with relatively low volume and get an extremely effective stimulus to stimulate growth in all my muscle fibers. But I think there's there's definitely more dangers to keeping too many reps in reserve, especially if your goal is hypertrophy. So I would not be afraid to train a true failure and then accept the fact that, hey, you might not do four times 20 or, you know, three times 12 or a whole bunch of volume like you see on social media. If you see all that social media stuff, um, just know that they're probably leaving, you know, three or four reps in reserve at least. If they can hit 15 reps consecutively on three sets or four sets, like that, there's the only way that that occurs is with a whole bunch of suboptimal, you know, less than ideal effort on those sets training far away from true muscular failure. Yeah, totally. Four by 15 with 60 second rest in between, right? <laughs> One of the things I usually tell my clients because a question that I get, I get often when I first start working with clients, like, hey, I wasn't able to do the same number of reps on all on all sets. Is that okay? I'm like, no, it's to be expected. Like if you train hard enough, your reps should decrease every set. That's a good indicator that you are pushing yourself, right? I think the whole argument of not pushing near failure frequently comes as from this whole idea of like fatigue generation, right? Personally, I think that is way over exaggerated because if you push near failure with a good amount of volume, that's not ridiculous and you train four times a week, I just don't think it's so much fatigue that you can't recover from if you're pushing near failure on like a leg press, right? It's just, it's just not that difficult to, I know there are different variables that influence recovery, right? Like age, sleep, etc. But let's say you're not super, super old. And let's say you take care of your recovery, you eat well, you get sufficient protein, right? So you cover the majority of your bases. I train pretty much one RIR, max two RIR on all my sets across the board. I probably do about 12 to 15 ish sets, 15 on the very high end at the end of a mesocycle for a particular muscle group. And I always feel pretty fine. Like, yes, towards the end, I'm a little bit more sore than typical, but it's never so much that like it really impacts my recovery. It really impacts my performance. And that's what I see so many people talking about, right? It's like, oh, if you go very near failure, like you're not going to be able to handle as much volume, which is true, but it's not like you can't handle enough volume to make optimal progress, right? But they're just like, you shouldn't push near failure because you can't do as much work. You're not going to recover that well. I think it's a lot of bullshit, man. Like, <laughs> I think you can train very near failure with adequate volume to progress and be perfectly fine in terms of recovery. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I think, again, I, I think we had some original volume landmarks where it's like, okay, you got to do 20 sets a week. And seemingly people are stuck on that and you don't have to do all that volume to maximize muscle growth. Me personally, this might surprise people, but I do one to four sets per week on all my muscle groups. Um, and that's not like squats one to four sets and then leg press one to four sets. So it's like, no, if I'm going to train quads, I'm going to do a set of squats, a set of leg press and a set of quad extensions. And that's three sets. And then I'm done with quads. Uh, I only train quads once a week. I, I kind of have uh, a little bit more lower body, but if I'm going to train biceps and I'm only going to do two sets on Monday and then two sets on Friday and that's four total sets and I'm done with biceps. And sometimes if my fatigue is too high, then I will reduce it and do three sets or two sets. Um, so I'll kind of cycle within that little area, depending, auto-regulate, depending how I'm feeling. But essentially, the, the one thing that you want to make sure that you're getting out of your program is strength progression. The muscle, about 80% of the volume inside of the muscle cell is the contractile proteins. Um, so most of the, the mass, aside from water, uh, of the muscle cell is the contractile proteins that generate force. So there's not a perfect relationship between size and strength, but it's a relatively... Um, linear relationship. Linear, yeah, linear relationship. Whereas if you're getting stronger, you're going to get bigger. Um, so I feel like no matter what you do, no matter how much volume you do, strive to see 
strength progressions. And no matter how far away from train to failure you are, strive to see those strength progressions. And I think one of the easiest ways to find your optimal volume or find a plan that's working for you is just like simplify your training completely. Take one workout, let's say you do it Monday, and then repeat it on Friday. Did you get stronger? Um, or are you significantly weaker? I wouldn't train dr- drastically change everything uh, based on one workout because you said there's there's many variables to this. There's sleep, there's your level of arousal, there's caffeine, uh, there's nutrition, your carbohydrate intake. But if you're you know take one workout, workout A, repeat it every you know four days. If you're not progressively getting stronger, that's too much work. That's too much volume. And I think overtraining is more so associated with too much volume rather than training too close to failure. So if that were me, I would reduce the quantity of sets I do. And then after you find out a, a workable volume where you're consistently getting stronger, you're either doing more reps at a specific weight or you're doing more total weight um, for the same quantity of reps. Once you find that volume, then you maybe add you know workout A and then workout B and then switch them up and cycle them up and add a little variety and variation. But I think to find your perfect volume, to not overkill your body, um, to find uh, an adequate reps and reserve that works for you, just repeat workouts and see if you're getting stronger. And if you're not getting stronger consistently, then that's too much. You got to taper things mm-hmm. down. I would love to know what you think an adequate time frame is to assess whether you're progressing or not. Because at a certain point in your training, you're just not going to get stronger every single week, right? Or maybe you think that that's not true either. Um, at least for me personally, let's say I'm doing three sets of something, right? I'll gauge trying to get perhaps an additional rep, not even necessarily on the first set, but maybe the third set, right? Um, but what is a realistic time frame for somebody to gauge whether what they're doing is effective or not? Because especially the longer you've been training, I feel like there are more acute fluctuations in performance. A lot of extraneous variables, I think, influence you more. You're more sensitive to them when you are more trained, right? Because when you first start training, I think the the training stimulus is so high that other things don't really interfere with like you getting stronger, right? If you've never lifted before, like I can do some bench press today, do a couple sets and maybe get some shitty sleep and drink a couple days and then go back into the gym and I'm stronger. I can't do that now. If I train really hard today and I do really well and I get, I have a stressful week of work and poor sleep because I'm thinking about work, like it'll acutely affect my performance. Does that mean that inherently I was doing too much volume? Perhaps not, right? So what would be a realistic time frame to gauge progress for a beginner versus somebody who's perhaps slightly more advanced? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. First yeah. thing is, what you just said makes total sense physiologically. There's actually differences in signaling in protein synthesis from someone who is advanced and trained versus someone who's a beginner. The The anabolic window, essentially how much you build and how quickly you can build protein chains, it is much larger for a beginner than an advanced lifter. So the the anabolic window, if you will, uh, it's shrunk for an advanced lifter. So a beginner, they just have more leeway where they can essentially, yeah, I might, you know, skip a meal or two, or yeah, I might lose a little sleep, but the signaling inside their muscle cells is different. It's so much stronger. They're going to sort of take in all the resources they have available, the amino acids, the, the energy, you know, the glucose, the fatty acids, and they're going to make use of those because the training stimulus is just so strong and there's different signaling there's different activity of the proteins inside of the muscle cell to sti- to stimulate growth in the beginner more so than the advanced lifter um, when it comes to progressing strength over time uh, or just making progress over time and what is a realistic rate of expectation the first thing you got to do is repeat workouts be, or, and, and repeat exercises because if you're jumping around exercises too much then you're going to get the neuromuscular gains, sort of the technique, the neuromuscular proficiency. Mm. So I see people all the time, every you know three weeks or four weeks, I'm going to do brand new exercises. Well, that's super hard to gauge progress because there's about a six to eight week phase where you're just learning the technique of the movement. For example, if you were to squat for four weeks, you're going to get stronger. And then, all right, I'm going I'm to ditch squats. I'm going to do leg press for four weeks. And then I'm going to reincorporate squats for four weeks. It's hard to judge true muscular hypertrophy because you're going to make so many technical gains within those small windows. So I think sticking to one sort of a a foundational lift, I call it kind of power building, sort of those key exercises, your squats, your leg press, your deadlift, you know, a machine chest press, a machine shoulder press, 
um, sticking to those core foundational exercises and repeating them uh, for a long time, th then there's no point where you're going to stop growing from squats or stop growing from leg press if you're continually getting stronger. I think the first thing you got to do is maybe simplify the program in terms of I don't have to do every exercise, but I have to repeat the core foundational exercises. And then after that, what's a realistic rate of expectation when I'm eliminating those neuromuscular gains and I'm just kind of going off the pure hypertrophy, I think for females or maybe someone smaller, I think adding about 2.5 pounds to each side. Um, so that's a, a net gain of five pounds every about three weeks. That would be a good rate to assess progression. And if you're larger, you have more absolute size, maybe add 2.5 pounds to each side or five pounds to each side for a net gain of five to 10 pounds uh, every three weeks and be super consistent with that and take that, you know, that's, that's a huge win. Yeah. To add. I feel like sometimes, you know, when you're super hyped up, you're jacked up or something like that, you know, the, the pre-workouts hitting your gym crushes, wearing some hoochie shorts, looking good. <laughs> you want to add like 20 pounds or 30 pounds. Yeah. Like, that is not a good idea. As tempting as it is, even if you're feeling yeah. it in the moment, that's not going to win the marathon. That might yeah. win the sprint, but then the workouts after that, you're going to be like, Oh, I'm fucked. Yeah. Like you're going to be so fatigued. You're going to be so KO'd. So I think just adding small progressions, you know, maybe five pounds every three weeks for females or, or someone smaller. And then if you have more absolute total mass, maybe five to 10 pounds every three weeks. And that is a massive win. And it's, there might be some three week blocks where you don't progress and it might take six weeks um, or, you know, four weeks or five weeks, but, but that's okay. But be very satisfied with those. And if you just do the math, if you divide that, you know, that's 52 divided by three, um, cause you're going to be 15, 16 ish around there. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to, you know, increase the weight every three weeks. There's 52 weeks in a year divided by three. So that's like 17 weight yeah. increases. If you multiply that times five, you're going to be adding some plates pretty quick in one year. Yeah. You know, you just got to play the long end. Or if you multiply it by 10, you know, if you're a larger human, 17 times time, 17 weight increases times 10 pounds, that's 170 pounds that you're almost adding two plates to each side. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's when you think about the long term, a slow, steady progression every three weeks, just try to get a little bit stronger. That's going to be your best bet. And a year from now or two years from now, you're going to look back and say, wow. And your physique is going to reflect it because you're going to build all those new contractile proteins yeah. that are associated with lifting heavier and heavier weight. Yeah. Are you tired of spending countless hours grocery shopping, cooking and preparing your meals? I get it. Time is precious, and that's where Icon Meals comes into play. I've partnered with Icon Meals to bring you delicious, macro-friendly, and high-protein meals that will make it easier than ever for you to achieve your fitness goals. I understand that you may have hesitations over the cost of a meal prep service compared to cooking food at home. But let's face it, how often do you spend more money eating out because you didn't have time to prepare your food at home anyways? With Icon Meals, you not only save time, but you invest in your health. These meals are carefully crafted to be healthier and more in line with your fitness goals than most of the food that you eat out anyways. So why wait? Visit iconmeals.com and explore their wide array of mouth-watering meals. And as a special bonus for listening to this podcast, use code JOSEPH10 at checkout for a special discount off of your order. By the way, you can find all of the necessary links in the description of this podcast. Don't let time be a barrier to your success. Choose Icon Meals and fuel your journey towards a healthier, fitter you. And how realistic would you say it is to add five to 10 pounds to the bar every three weeks for an extended period of time, right? Because I'm hearing you say this and like, I definitely, maybe I'm doing something wrong with my training, but I definitely can't add five pounds every three weeks. Um, I think maybe realistically on compound movements, I might be adding five pounds every two months, three months, maybe. Um, and that's when I'm also like actively gaining weight, right? Because I think that's another important component here. Like guys, if you're trying to lose weight, uh, doing this stuff is going to be very difficult simultaneously, especially if you have like over two or three years of training experience under your belt, like of actually training hard, right? Because we can't, we can't deny that like you need to eat sufficiently to grow. But let's say you're eating sufficiently, right? How frequently do you progress, Chester, with your personal tra training? Like, would you say you gain about five pounds uh, of strength on the bar every month or so? At least, yeah. And yeah. I think this was what comes down to my crazy volume principles that 
seemingly I, I'm, you know, N equals one trying to do it. And I've got a few of my clients doing it and my girlfriend's doing it. Um, but it's a really low volume, the one to four sets per week. And I find that the only reason you're not going to gain strength is you're, you're under recovered, right? Like you, you try to go from this, you know, work, the first workout to the second workout and you're trying to gain strength and you don't get there. It's because you're under recovered and a synonym for it's a great point, because if you do push hard enough, it should elicit strength, right? Yeah. And so yeah, if you are right. pushing hard and you're not getting stronger, perhaps you're doing too much. Yeah. The, you're under recovered and a synonym for that is overtrained and overtrained means you're doing too much volume. So I think that this approach to low volume, it allows you to get stronger and really make like we kind of talked about intent earlier, every single set you do, you're trying to be as good or better than your previous best. So every single set you do with the low volume approach, training close to failure has that intent. And I think it's the op I'm not going to use optimal, but the most ideal way to gauge progress and gradually increase that strength. And it's kind of funny. Uh, my girlfriend's a power lifter um, or used to be a power lifter. Now she's kind of hybriding it we'll called power building. Mm -hmm. But using this approach, she just does one working set of deadlifts every week. She has seen steady gains. She has not plateaued since kind of doing the transition. Mm -hmm. And she used to have an extremely high level, top level power lifting coach. And she's making more gains doing this lower volume approach because she's going into every workout, not overtrained. She's not going in you know, trying to do a whole bunch of volume and then under recovering and trying to overreach again the next workout. She goes in fresh. And what's super also incredibly important to realize is the body has an order of precedence in which it grows muscle. You do not add muscle unless you repair your existing muscle. So the body only grows when muscle damage is lower. Um, so keeping muscle damage lower, and I think a low volume approach is the best way to experience both strength and hypertrophy gains. You're just not going to grow a lot of new mass if you're wrecked, if you're, yeah. if you're struggling. Yeah, dude, those are some really great concepts. And I'm thinking here about some things I might be doing to my programming and training because so I know that you and I talked a little bit about this back when we were both in graduate school, right? We had this conversation probably around four years ago now. And I was like, Hey man, like, what are your thoughts on volume? Like, what do you think is a good approach? And you told me that you really liked um, the approach that Mike Isretel shares, right? Which I think conceptually, his general philosophy to training is very solid, right? Like, you can follow his approach, and you'll probably make some pretty great progress. And his whole thought process is around that 10 to 12 ish sets per week, which compared to what a lot of people think is not that high in volume, right? Like you tell somebody, Hey, you're only going to do 10 sets total for your chest in the week, not in a workout. And they're like, that's not a lot of work. And I'm here thinking like, man, when I do 10 sets of chest, like I'm spent, right? I might do, I personally do most of the time about 10 to 12 sets per muscle. I'm now right now experimenting with slightly higher volume and I want to share what my experience has been so far. But when I do five hard sets for my chest and that might be two dumbbell based sets, two barbell based sets and like one fly based uh, set, right? Like on a machine or something, my chest is done. <laughs> it's done. Right. And doing that twice a week, I'm like, this is a good amount of work, but now you're doing substantially less than that. Right. And maybe what I want to get from you is like, what did you realize with your training? Uh, what was going on that, that made you go through that transition to try even lower volume? I think I just was struggling on progressing strength. And I realized yeah. that was just a matter of overtraining. But I think also what's was so important when, when people talk about sets, they just say, I do five sets a week. I do 10 sets. I do 20 sets. How, prepared are you to perform those sets? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I'm going to do my leg workout, it's one set of squats, one set of leg press, one set of quad extensions. Before my working set of squats, I'm going to warm up, you know, let's say I want to do 405 for 10 reps or something like that on squats. I'm going to do 135. I'm going to do 225. Then I'm going to rest for three minutes. Then I'm going to do 315 for, you know, and this is all warm up sets. So yeah. way far away from failure. And then I'm going to rest again for another four or five minutes. And then I'm going to do 365. Then I'm going to rest again. Then I might do one rep at 405. So my warm up to get to my working set is 25, 30 minutes. On yes, squat. totally. And then, okay, I'm going to go hit leg press. 
well, I got to warm up that movement too. So I'm, you know, let's say I'm going to go 11 plates for 10 reps or something like that. Well, I'm going to start with six plates and then I'm going to rest, you know, three minutes and I'm going to do eight plates for a little bit. And then I'm going to rest for another five minutes and then do my working set. And then quad extension, same thing. I'm not going to just jump right into that because my knees aren't ready to go. You know, I'm not familiar. Yeah. My, my muscle connection is going to be way off. So I'm going to warm up with warm up specific exercises for every single set I do. So when I hit that one working set, or sometimes it's two working sets, you know, calves, uh, forearms, things like that, biceps, um, they can get like two working sets. But when I'm ready to hit that working set, it is going to be such high quality because I'm amply prepared for it. It's yeah. not just like I'm jumping in. Like if, if you were to do, what was your chest? Like dumbbell uh, exercises and then chest flies. Well, after the dumbbell work, I would go before the chest flies, I would do some warm up specific sets for the chest flies. That way, when I did my chest flies, they're going to be absolutely fabulous. I'm not going to gas myself out on my warm up. You know, I'm going to keep a whole bunch yeah. of reps in reserve. Um, but I think it makes a tremendous difference how ready and prepared you are. So you don't just look at sets in, a, in the, like an isolated, all right, this person has five sets, this person has 10 sets, this person has 15 sets. Like what is the warm up? What is the level of preparation prior to the set? And then you can gauge the set's intent and purpose once you're sufficiently amply you know, warmed up, your arousal's good, the, the movement's feeling great. Uh, one thing that I also like doing is if I'm doing more than you know, eight reps, I like to do a warm up set at my working weight. So if I'm going to squat 405 for 10 reps, then I'm going to do 405 for one. And then, okay, I hit that. And then I'll set my rest interval for, you know, six minutes or whatever it is. And then once I'm ready to do that one working set, it's just going to be absolutely fabulous quality. Yeah. All the reps are going to be great. So I think your level of preparation, that's probably what led me to the, um, to the lower set scheme on the volume was yeah. I realized is I wasn't maybe one, I wasn't progressing strength, but two, maybe I wasn't sufficiently warmed up uh, mm -hmm. prior to doing all the movements. And, you know, I gradually got, let's say, you know, I would do kind of the pyramid approach where you start off with lower. Yeah, totally. Was it lower weight, higher reps and gradually kind of yeah. got warmed up. Um, I was just, I, those working sets were more so just warm ups. Yeah. So now essentially I'm warming up to prepare for, you know, a top set or two working sets for all my exercises. And I'm getting exponentially more results. So just being sufficiently warming up uh, or sufficiently warmed up, that's going to make the, a tremendous difference in the quality of your sets and probably going to lead you to lower volume. Cause when you're sufficiently warmed up, you're going to push way more weight. Yeah. That's a very interesting thought process for sure. So yeah, it's funny cause I've tried a bunch of different stuff personally. And I, I did like for the longest time, especially in undergrad and stuff, I did a crazy amount of volume and like thinking back on it now, how silly it was. Cause just like the intensity wasn't there. The focus wasn't there. The effort wasn't there. Right. It was like doing four by 12 for the purpose of doing four by 12. And so I went from doing like 20 sets or so for a muscle to 10. And I was like, man, this is low volume, but like I can really push hard here. And I was like, based off of literature, about 10 sets seems appropriate. So I'm doing this. And for the longest time, this would be my general structure for the main muscle groups. And let's just separate it into like pushing, pulling and legs. Okay. I would do each muscle, each major muscle twice weekly. I would do two compound movements with two sets each. And then I would do an isolation movement one set. So five total sets for the muscle. Like I said, for chest, I would say two sets of dumbbell chest press, two sets of inclined barbell, and then one fly, one set of a fly movement. That would be five sets. That would be one session. And I would repeat something very similar, but slightly different movement patterns on a secondary day. Right. And with that volume, I can definitely push really hard. Like it doesn't seem like it's a crazy amount of work in one session, right? Like it's certainly manageable. Like it's enough volume to where like, I can really push hard on this. I don't feel like I'm overdoing it cause I'm doing 10 plus sets in a session. However, I never, like when I stick with something, I kind of just do it for a really long time. And like, I become somewhat mindless about it. And recently I've been trying to be a little bit more methodical and experiment with some of these variables more. And I've been trying to increase my volume a little bit in terms of number of sets over a mesocycle by just assessing how ready I feel to increase volume, right? So the first week of the mesocycle, I started right where I told you five sets per muscle twice weekly for 10 sets. Then for the next two weeks after that, so weeks two and three, which I actually, I just finished the fourth week and I'll tell you what I did on the fourth week, but sets two and uh, weeks two and three, I simply increased a set on the third movement on the isolation movement. So it's not very taxing. So now I'm doing two sets of dumbbells, two sets of barbell and two sets of fly uh, for both of the sessions. So it went from 10 to 12. And now this fourth week, 
Um, so I'm doing it a slight increase in volume every two weeks. This fourth week, I increased a set on the secondary movement. So now I went two sets of dumbbells, three sets of barbells, two sets of flies. I immediately felt like, fuck, this is way harder. Um, <laughs> doing two sets of dumbbells near failure, inclined dumbbells, and then going to two sets of barbell bench press was difficult already. And what I've noticed, and we've talked about this, just the the thought that I know that I have a third set inherently does not allow me to push as hard on the first set because I just know I have X, Y, Z number of sets left. So psychologically, it was really taxing. And just physiologically, I was like, man, after two sets I'm spent and now I have to do a third set. And so my reps actually decreased. I did 11 reps the first set, rested about six minutes, hit 10 reps the second set. And that third set, I only hit six reps. So a huge fall off. I'm assuming part of that fall off is also due to the fact that I'm not used to doing a third set. So it was completely novel, but I did that the first session. And when I went into the second session, so those first three weeks, it's also hard to gauge because I came back from vacation. So I was progressing every week in terms of hitting an additional rep on the first set. Could be volume driven, could be based off the fact that I didn't train for two weeks. So it was like coming back super fresh. But this fourth week was the first time that on that second workout, I didn't hit a PR on any set across the board, but I increased volume on that first session. So I don't know if perhaps it was too much, right? And I, I wanted to try this a little bit higher volume approach for about eight to 10 weeks or so and see how I respond. But based off this conversation, I don't know if it's worth it, man. <laughs> I would do lower volume. Yeah. I think also we got to look at the literature. The literature loves to increase sets. Okay. Yeah. You go, it's like, what do we just have? 52 sets. And every two weeks we added four or six sets. So there's a brand new study uh, that came out, if you're not familiar. And they did 52 sets a week. Per muscle? Uh, it was on quads. They just did the, the okay. body. Um, so 52 sets is just absolutely ridiculous. I highly yeah. recommend yeah. nobody <laughs> ever attempts that. Um, but I didn't How do you general, even do that, man? That's That doesn't even sound... A whole bunch good. of soft sets. Yeah. But anyways, if we look at the literature from, you know what is it, 50,000 feet or whatever, we got to look at the general population that does resistance training studies are largely untrained people, mm -hmm. okay? They're, I would say the vast majority, I think we on the, the protein analysis that said by Morton, it said eat a gram of um, protein per body weight. I think out of all the resistance training studies they did, I think, what was it, like, 40 of them at least use untrained people. So we're looking at a whole bunch of untrained people uh, that do these studies. So if you're untrained, you've never picked up weights in your life, it naturally kind of makes sense to start with low volume because if you've never done anything, you're highly susceptible to muscle damage and muscle damage slows growth. You don't want to destroy someone the first time they're in the gym. So yeah. you purposely start low. And then if you've never done anything, what you want to do as a researcher is you want to make those neuromuscular gains quickly. So you repeat things, you repeat squats, you repeat the same exercises, and you build on the quantity of volume you do per set. It helps the research participant gain a neuromuscular proficiency faster. So okay. you're purposefully starting lower because you want to keep that muscle damage low, and then you gradually build because you want to expedite how quickly the participant makes those neuromuscular gains. So in the research, it makes sense to add sets. You know, you, you have the perfect population where increasing sets on a sort of a weekly basis or adding volume, it makes a whole lot of physiological and psychological sense to increase the volume and overload in that manner. But for someone who's trained, you're not going to make any more neuromuscular proficiency gains if you've been squatting for two years or a year or 10 weeks. Yeah. So I think the the a much better way to overload for someone who is trained, you don't start super low because, you know, you, you have sort of a protective effect build up um, and you don't have to necessarily increase sets. I think progressing weight or trying to add reps in the same quantity of sets would be much more advantageous than just increasing the quantity of sets. But if you look at the literature, again, it makes sense to increase sets. But if you look at practicality in the real world, you know, kind of let's blend PubMed with practicality, it makes sense to more so increase the quality of your sets than rather increase the quantity of your sets. I think that's a much better way to overload is just try to squeeze out a couple more reps or increase the weight. And that's indicative of you're going to recruit more muscle. Yeah. 
um, by uh, trying to squeeze out a few more reps, or you're going to be adding the contractile proteins, which is indicative of you growing if you add more weight. So I think instead of focusing on set quantity, I think increasing set quality. And when that happens, set quantity might even go down. Um, that's just the natural quantity versus quality relationship. I think that's a much better approach for somebody who is a trained person. And by trained, you don't have to be, you know, a bodybuilder doing this for 10 yeah. years. You could just be someone doing this for six months. Yeah. Um, if you've already developed the, the protective yeah, effect yeah, yeah. and neuromuscular proficiency. Right? So I think there has to be a drastic shift away from, okay, even though research does it this way, what, well, when, when now we know why research does it that way. It's because they're population. And if you don't resemble that population, then maybe try to focus on quality over quantity. Yeah. So even talking to you here, I think I'm noticing like you're not you're not saying that more volume is inherently a bad thing, right? And I think that's perhaps what people get wrong about your message sometimes. Like this guy's saying that volume is bad. And it, it's not. It's the fact that like if you train with sufficient intensity, if you train hard enough, you simply can't do X amount of volume. And if you do do X amount of volume, it may be hindering your ability to progress because you're simply inducing too much muscle damage, which you're not recovering from, which hinders your ability to make strength gains, which is the primary driver of improvements in muscle growth, right? So your whole thought is like, yeah, if you could do more volume, it's probably advantageous. Most people just can't do more volume when training with appropriate intensity and effort, correct? That is 100% correct. And oftentimes, when I was programming back in the day for myself, I would get so carried away, like, I got to do this exercise, and I got to do that exercise. You know, I got to I gotta hack squat, I got to squat, I got to do leg press, I got to do barbell walking lunges, I got to do quad extension, I got to do it all. Um, but I just could not recover. Like, I wanted to do the volume. Yeah. I just was seeing plateaus in my strength and that led me to dropping my volume. So it's not like I'm anti-volume by any means. I'm do I'm pro my stance is do an appropriate amount of work that you can recover from. And if that just happens to be significantly lower than some of the numbers in the literature, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 sets and some of the other things that you've been hearing online, then that's okay. That's your body. You know, yeah. you train with more intent than the other people. You train better warmed up. You yeah. know, maybe some of the working sets, they're doing like a hangover warm up thing because they're not fully warmed up. Um, but if you're amped up every single set from a psychological standpoint and you're physiologically warmed up, then naturally your set quantity just might drop. Uh, yeah. And if, that, if that's what you need to increase strength, then that's what you need to increase strength because yeah. again, Getting back to the first question, intensity, that tension, that's the, the main driver of growth. And we need to achieve that. We need to keep progressing that. Yeah, dude, so many, like, I think we could honestly talk about this for three or four hours. I have so many thoughts in my head. I want you to talk about perhaps some practical recommendations for people listening. Okay. Like what would you recommend be a starting point for most people who are lightly trained? Let's say they've been training pretty consistently for a couple months, maybe a year or so, but they're still learning. Obviously, we're all always still learning. What would be a good place to start with volume? What would be good indicators that perhaps you should drop volume, which we've talked about a little bit, you can just lightly go over those. But then what would be a good indicator that perhaps you might benefit from an increase in volume as well? Okay, um, I think it's really hard to tell like what's a generic starting point, like, okay, everyone start with four sets, or everyone start with six sets, because everyone's arousal is different. Totally. For me, I train, I train very aggressive. Like, I don't want to have conversations. I don't want to make eye contact with someone before I'm done squatting. Like, I'm just so locked in the mode. Yeah. Um, and, and not everyone trains like that. Um, so I think dating back to uh, kind of what we stated earlier, like, simplify your workout plan. Find those exercises that you just love doing and you're, you're confident you respond to. And you can do them pain-free because, remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Totally. So do, you know – Let's say two to three exercises and we'll call it workout a take your necessary time off and just repeat workout a and then let's see if you can increase reps or increase strength and if you're dramatically weaker then you did too much 
Now, you know, if you're about the same or maybe there's a little drop off again, you know, shit happens. It could be arousal, yeah. could be lack of sleep, could be lack of calories, could be stress, could be distraction. Um, but I would just consistently repeat that workout A. And if you're discovering you're not adding reps or adding strength on a consistent basis, especially kind of in that three week realm where you're kind of, OK, it's time to up, you know, five to ten pounds, then that's just too much. You know, yeah. whatever you're doing, it's too much. And it's not like, oh, my gosh, you know just don't feel obligated to do all those exercises or all that volume. Mm -hmm. It's okay to taper back and understand that, you know, Oh my gosh, I'm missing anything. You're not going to miss anything. You're actually going to serve yourself better. If you're no longer running yourself into a brick wall and training under recovered every single time, you yeah. know, don't be over fatigue. Don't be so obligated to hit every single angle. I feel like that's another thing on social media. You know, people are inventing workouts to entertain. Yeah. You. Yeah. 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 Got to do that thing. You know, Fitzbo person yeah. X that one and Fitzbo person why did that one and then these are the basics I got to do the basics like just simplify your plan find the exercises yeah. that you enjoy doing and then just try to stick with them and and see okay am I getting stronger and if you're not getting stronger pull back on those reins yeah make sure all, yeah you're sufficiently warmed up every set don't don't have that sort of like delay that you know some of your working sets are actually just warm-up sets just yeah. make sure when it's time to get it, it's time to get it. And then also, super important, record your workouts. Like, don't go off memory. Track your workouts. Yeah. Have, you know, I have a workout app. It's called uh, Physique Lab. Um, but right, even if you don't use my app, just write stuff down. Yeah. Um, don't don't go off memory. Have a logbook. Have a, a fitness app that's going to help you uh, memorize or, or not. So you don't have to memorize. Just have this information available readily to you, so you know exactly what the target is. You're not winging it. So. Do you think there are any indicators that could tell a person that maybe they would benefit from a little bit more volume? I think it's always experimental. You know, if you're feeling like, Ooh, I'm, I'm mighty fresh. Um, yeah. then sure, add a set. I would also strive to increase the weight before you want to add that set, increase the set quality. And then once you're sure, like, okay, my sets are just continuously yeah. good two, three weeks in a row. I'm, I'm increasing strength all the time. Um, then maybe add another set. Or add a different exercise with another set. Maybe, you know, attack a different angle or something like that. I think that can be pretty good. Um, let's yeah. say if you're doing um, squats and quad extensions, then maybe add a leg press or add a walking lunge. Give yourself not just another set, but maybe a schmeckin' of a different resistance profile uh, that your body has to adapt to, a schmeckin' of a different angle. Uh, and I think that can be advantageous. So maybe, yeah, that's again, a great point you brought up. And that's something you shared with me a while back that I took into consideration with my training that I really enjoyed. Because from a time perspective, you know, like doing social media, doing a podcast, having a kid, like I don't have two hours to just spend at the gym. And one thing I used to do was limit my exercise selection and do more sets. And you and I had a conversation like, no, 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 do less sets, do more exercises. Because slightly different resistance profile can provide a slightly different stimulus, which could be beneficial. And I uh, implemented that into my training and I just overall enjoyed training way more, right? Because I went from doing four sets of squats to just two sets of squats and then two sets of leg press. And even again, like so much, so much of training is psychological, right? Like just the idea of like, fuck, I'm not going to do four sets of squats. That is so nice because four sets of squats is grueling. I'm only going to do two. I could push a lot harder. And then when I went to the leg press, I also noticed that there was less of a drop off with performance and I could feel a little bit fresher with the leg press and push there as well. Um, so I really like that, that tip that you gave me in terms of like, have a little bit more exercise variety, keep the sets per exercise low. Question for you. Do you think there are certain muscle groups that do inherently, um, or that can inherently handle more volume like calves, for example? Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. Some of the research on this, um, they say the pull muscles, and it's not they say, there's actual data on this, and I can reference it if you need, um, you know, like in, in the comments or something like that. But they say uh, pull muscles are more susceptible to damage than push muscles. Totally. So if you think, think about this from an everyday perspective, you know, you're walking upstairs, you may be lifting stuff over your head, you might be using your push muscles a little bit more than your pull muscles, and thus your push muscles are a little bit more resistant to damage. Therefore, they might, not necessarily, but might be able to handle a little bit higher volume. Um, push muscles. Push muscles, yeah. And there's also evidence that says the biceps in particular are one of the most sensitive muscles to damage. Um, mm -hmm. They've done studies comparing like sort of a, a very similar exercise in the quads and the biceps. And the quads 
you know, they experienced a little bit of, okay, we, we were trained, but in the biceps, they actually found tissue necrosis, meaning muscle cells died. Uh, so you can just stimulate your, your body so much that you experience cell death, um, which is never advantageous if you're trying to grow muscle. It's never good to have dead cells if you're trying to grow them. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the biceps are more susceptible to damage, so you might do them with a little bit um, less work. Yeah. Also, I think muscles that you're using a whole bunch, like the forearms, even though you might not do a whole bunch of wrist curls, let's say you want to build some juicy, meaty Python forearms, you're going to use your forearms a lot in your, your back movements and your lateral raises for your shoulders and pretty much any time you grip things. So that might naturally lead to uh, your forearms having a little bit less volume because you don't want to develop tendonitis or anything like that. Um, so each muscle is not a identical um, and you should kind of probably take note of, of how you're training each muscle and keep a little log on specific volume uh, for your various muscles. And also exercise selection makes a key difference. You know, um, if you're going to do hanging leg raises for your abs where you're hanging above overhead and bring your legs up, that's a very demanding exercise. Um, whereas if you're just going to do some like floor exercises, like reverse crunches, that's not nearly as demanding. So the, the, how difficult the exercises are, that's going to make a, a massive impact as well on sort of the volume per muscle group. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. I, I wasn't unaware. I was unaware of the data showing that, uh, pulling muscles are more susceptible to damage. But as you were saying that anecdotally thinking about it, I definitely experienced that with my training, like I put more volume and emphasis on pressing movements on my legs because my pressing movements, just like squats, for example, are just way weaker than my deadlifts, right? So I inherently do a lot less volume on my pulling movements for lower body. However, my hamstrings and glutes are always sore. My quads are never sore. Never is an understatement, but like they're never sore to the touch. Like my hamstrings are typically after training always sore to the touch. And I always either match or do less volume on hamstrings than I do on quads. And I've gotten to that point because I'm always thinking like, man, like, why can I hammer my quads and they don't really get sore? And why do I do two fucking sets of RDLs and my hamstrings are screaming, you know? So I'm sure that's a variable, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's naturally just evolution. You know, whatever muscles you work more, there might be a little bit of a protective effect. Um, and that's kind of work more throughout your lifetime. And, and it could be specific individual versus individual mm -hmm. in terms of your movement patterns and your lifestyle and things like that. Uh, but I think in general, having a tally, writing a notebook, collecting data about yourself, like I wish, <clears throat> you know, I've been doing this for over 10 years. I wish I recorded stuff when I was 18. I yeah. wouldn't be guessing when I was 22 yeah. or 26. I'm not going to date myself and say how old I am, but I wouldn't be guessing for as long <laughs> as I'm guessing if I can make essentially hypotheses educated yeah. changes yeah. based on my actual data. So having a fitness log or a fitness journal where you record all the information about yourself it is absolutely vital if you want to achieve the fastest transformation. Yeah. And it, it is so hard, man, because like it is one of those things progress is influenced by so many extraneous variables, right? There's so many confounding variables. It can be really hard. Like, there might be a period of time where you progressed really well, maybe not even because your programming is optimal, but like everything else in your life was optimal and conducive towards making progress. And like people really underestimate perhaps the influence of some of these other variables. Like, dude, since having a kid, like I just don't sleep the entire night. I can't. My baby wakes up crying. That impacts performance so much. And it's not even like a huge impact in performance acutely. But I definitely am not hitting PRs consistently when I'm not sleeping well, right? I might just be matching my performance. I might be a little bit less focused. I might just be like getting into the gym because I just have to get my workout in. And all of that stuff impacts long-term progress so much. You know, one thing you were mentioning, and I know I'm bouncing back and forth here, with with the pulling muscles being a little bit more susceptible to um to damage and we can transition here into talking about exercise selection. Do you think it's also inherently because pulling based movements typically allow you to stretch the muscle more than pressing based movements like a barbell bench press you're limited by the bar hitting your back a pull-up you can just literally go to a dead hang on the bottom really stretch out the, the the back right on any rowing movement you can really get a good stretch in the back 
Whereas a lot of pressing movements, especially the way that people perform them, don't really get maximal stretch, right? I feel like these pulling base movements are just a little bit more natural in terms of getting a deep stretch in the muscle. What yeah, do you think genius. about that? Genius. It's something I didn't even consider. I mean, um, we have data that says if you train a muscle at a longer length, it's going to damage the muscle more, but you can develop a protective effect and damage can be similar between training at a long muscle length and that, and that deep stretch as opposed to a shorter muscle length. So that's another variable that's going to impact volume. If somebody's doing, you know, glute kickbacks and, you know, frog pumps and hip <laughs> thrusts, and their muscles are always in a shorter muscle length, yeah. they're going to be able to tolerate more volume. Whereas if you're stretching your muscle on your squats and your deep, uh, reverse lunges, you know, your deficit reverse lunges, you're going to do less volume. So the stretch is super important and something that you have to factor and consider in. But I always would recommend it kind of I'm jumping into kind of the topic of stretch media hypertrophy, but stretch media hypertrophy is kind of the new, the new craze on social media. Yeah. It just basically says muscles are going to grow better when they generate force in their stretched position compared to their shortened position. So there's some, very uh, consistent data that demonstrates you're, you're just going to grow more when you sh generate force in that stretch position, when you stretch your body at some point during the rep. So I think that that can be very good, advantageous, but you don't want to overdo it. Uh, and it very well could be that some of the pull exercises, you're going to get a deeper stretch, uh, which could cause some more muscle damage at the start, but eventually it'll be, it'll be worth it yeah. to, to stick with those uh, more stretch positions. But when you're transitioning to those more, um, maybe pull exercises or, or stretch oriented or emphasizing the stretch. Don't ego lift. Even on your push exercise, you know, really get low on that shoulder press, really kind of maximize the stretch on that chest press. Um, again, you could probably start with a little bit lower volume when you're starting to emphasize some of the, the deeper stretches and in, in the movements. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. I was just thinking about in terms of you mentioning that, you know, a deep stretch can cause more muscle damage because you see people train with limited range of motion and still have really high effort, right? Because you can still push really hard doing half reps and you can push very close to failure doing half reps. And I used to do that before I like started learning about the importance of full range of motion and all this good stuff. And one thing that I've noticed is that even if the effort is really high when you're limiting range of motion, at least for me personally, and I've seen this with clients too, who are just learning how to train correctly, typically the drop off in repetitions from set to set isn't that much. Um, I'm not sure if that is due to limited muscle damage because you're not training in that stretch position. I've noticed when I do a full range of motion, really emphasize the stretch when effort levels are similar, the rep drop off for me from set to set when I train with full range of motion is substantially more. Um, so I might do, let's say I'm doing two sets of leg press, full range of motion, deep stretch, pausing at the bottom. It might be 10 reps first set, maybe only like seven reps second set. Whereas limiting the range of motion, it's a lot easier to get closer to that same um, degree of performance. And I'm kind of just talking anecdotally here. I have thoughts going off the top of my head, but what are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's some legitimacy to that? Yeah. I mean, there's a number of different um, areas and how you fatigue throughout a workout. You know, it could be creatine phosphate, could be, you know, sarcoplasm reticulum. There's, it could be muscle recruitment. There's so many different areas of fatigue. Um, but whenever you do subject yourself to a more demanding exercise, and most of the time full ROM is way more demanding, yeah. you're, you're going to have a drop off in that performance, whether it's peripheral inside of the muscle or even mental, like, oh my God, I got to do another one of these yeah. grueling sets where I'm pausing at the bottom. And I think that's why I also kind of shape my volume is you just said you did 10 sets and then, or 10 reps and then seven reps. Uh, for me, I was like, okay, cool. I'd rather just do the 10 reps or maybe I'd rather do 11 yeah. reps in one set and just screw it. I'm not going to do the second set. I'm just going to do yeah. a different exercise. And I think that gradually uh, shaped my volume and, and yeah. led to better performance over the long run. Um, just kind of top set lifestyle. Yeah. And it's always, interesting. Sorry, go oh, ahead. Yeah. yeah. And when you have that sort of low volume approach, you're also, you're not afraid to emphasize the stretch. Or, or training that length and position because it's like, okay, I only got to do this like one time. You yeah. Know, I, I can, I can get up once no matter how much I'm struggling. I mean, I was training legs yesterday and I was just like limping from like workout to workout because I or exercise to exercise. Cause I was so fatigued. I was so drained. But when the time come, when the time came to do a set, I was like, okay, let's go. 
you know, and I yeah. could immediately lock it in and have an extremely productive leg day. Um, but in general, for everyone listening, do not be afraid of full ROM. Do not be afraid of the stretch. Even if the performance drops off, yeah. um, that is going to be your most advantageous, most growth promoting portion of the rep. And if anyone has the prime equipment, you can change the resistance profile. I would strive to uh, emphasize sort of add more weight in that stretch position, not completely deload, you know, the shortened position or the mid portion of the rep. Um, but certainly make that stretch position an emphasis because that's really, according to the literature, what's going to produce some dramatic uh, muscular changes and muscular yeah. growth. Hey guys, some of you may not know that I'm the scientific advisor for a supplement company called Outwork Nutrition. I help with the formulation of new products to help ensure that they're effective and backed by science. Unlike many other supplement companies out there, we don't rely on exaggerated claims or flashy marketing tactics. Instead, we let the science speak for itself. We take pride in formulating products that deliver real results, helping you achieve your fitness goals in a meaningful way. If you're in the market for supplements like protein powder, pre-workout, or recovery products, make sure to check us out at outworknutrition.com. And as a thank you for being an avid listener of this podcast, use code Joey for an exclusive discount at checkout. You can find a link to our website down in the description of this podcast episode. Remember, our goal is to empower you with science-backed supplements that truly make a difference. Choose Outwork Nutrition and elevate your fitness to new heights. Dude, and so, you know, you brought up something that I was thinking about earlier. It's like, if you're mainly chasing progress, right? Objective progress, getting another rep, adding five pounds. And last week you did 10 reps at a certain weight um, on your top set. And you come in the week after and you hit 11 reps on your top set. Like, what's the benefit of doing another set or two? I don't really know, right? Besides the idea that doing more volume will result in more hypertrophy. Louis Simmons said this, and obviously Louis worked with a completely different population, not hypertrophy training here, but his whole philosophy was like, come into the gym, hit a PR and go home. Like, don't do any more work. He's like, why? Like, what, what's the point? If like, you're trying to get maximally and Louis Simmons for people who are not listening is like, well, renowned strength coach work with some top level, like power lifters. And it's like the whole workout revolved around the one top set. And it's like, if last week you hit five and you came in this week and you hit six, like your workout's done. Now I think that's, a little bit over exaggerated because like I wouldn't come into the gym, do one set of squats and go home. Right. Like that's probably too little. And I guess that's where my question was of like, what are indicators that somebody should maybe increase volume? Because I think you can argue you can do too little, right? Like, and maybe the indicators are like, you feel super, super fresh, no soreness or tiredness at all. And you're not progressing. Right. Because if you feel super fresh and you're not progressing week to week, you might not be doing enough. Do you think that's a fair assumption? I don't know. I feel like if somebody trains, there's a, a well-documented drop-off where you get weaker. And then theoretically, if you're eating... Super compensation, right? Yep. Yeah, you're supposed to build back up stronger. I mean, it's not like you tear muscle down and build back, build back stronger. But essentially, you're stimulating growth. You build new proteins. It repairs what you got. And then you add new contractile proteins. And then you get stronger. Um, so theoretically, somebody should consistently be getting stronger. So if you're entering the gym super fresh, um, but your strength is going nowhere then that tells me that you might be overtraining. And I do think it's important to have multiple measures to measure success uh, and measure progress. You have circumferences uh, of different muscles, mm -hmm. but remember at any time you could be inflamed from, mm -hmm. oh, I, I just killed my biceps and my biceps look bigger, you know, two days later. Well, that could be just Swelling. inflammation in yeah. the workout. Swelling. Yeah. So I think strength is the gold standard to assess progress and muscle damage, but there's also the mirror. There's also body measurements. There's how your clothes are fitting. Um, so, and then of course, progress pictures. Um, yeah. so just documenting these things. Don't just say, Oh, I look good today, but actually like sit down every two weeks and okay, let's take pictures of my body and see what's, what's changing. So have multiple measures, um, of how you assess progress. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you're feeling fresh and nothing's happening, and then nothing's happening in the body circumferences and not just in the strength, but in the body circumferences in the mirror and, and these different avenues in which you can assess progress. Then it's like, okay, it's, it's time to make some changes. But I think that, yeah, three weeks, if, you, if you're getting on sort of a three to four week plateau in strength, um, no matter how you're feeling psychologically, I mean, you could have just got paid and you're like, yeah, I'm feeling great, but that doesn't mean you're, you're going to progress strength and, and get yeah. stronger 
experience hypertrophy. Uh, so don't let the mind play tricks and you get those objective measurements, get those circumferences, get those mirror pictures, and then combine that with your strength. And I feel like a multifaceted approach to judge that progress is going to be your best bet. And eventually you're going to see if you're truly progressing or not, irrespective yeah. of how you feel. So let me ask you a practical question. Then why do you do four sets per muscle versus just one set per muscle per week? I, I do one set. <laughs> I mean, um, there, there's evidence that says, and what I, what I do love is I like, like rat data. I like animal data because humans are, you know, you gotta, there's, there's a big psychological element with humans. Whereas yeah. with mice or cells, you just do it and you can see the, the signaling inside of the yeah, cell. Okay. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen. You can control food. You can control the stimulus. There's so yeah. many controls that you can do. And they've done studies um, where there's a plateau in protein synthesis. Now, protein synthesis post-workout doesn't perfectly predict growth, uh, but it's a very important variable that we can control. And they did one set, and there was a little bit of increase in protein synthesis. And then they did three sets, and there was a little bit larger increase in protein synthesis. And then they did five sets, and then there was sort of this, this plateau. And then they did 10 sets and 20 sets, and 10 sets and 20 sets had no further increase mm. in protein synthesis inside of the cell. Um, and that was with three minute rest intervals. So it makes you question like, okay, with three sets and longer than three minute rest intervals, can I increase protein synthesis even more? And if I'm going to do fewer sets, I can keep muscle damage lower. I can keep protein breakdown lower. Um, and they've also done human studies where there's sort of this, this, um, you know, you do one set and you see an increase in protein synthesis and you do three sets and you see a little bit more. And then they've done long-term studies where they did eight sets and they saw this increase in protein synthesis and they've done 12 sets and maybe it was a little bit more, but then protein breakdown was more. Uh, mm -hmm. And then hypertrophy was the same looking at eight sets versus 12 sets. So with how much volume you do, I kind of just did a whole bunch of numbers, probably confused people, not very good. Um, <laughs> which is how much volume you do, keep in mind the physiological purpose of that set. You're trying to trigger protein synthesis, so change the signaling inside of your cells while keeping protein breakdown as oh, low as possible. Because totally. you want protein synthesis to outweigh protein breakdown. Hypertrophy is that. Changes are the strength gains are that. You know, yeah. eventually at the end of the day, protein synthesis has to be much greater than protein breakdown. And that's how you change your body. So every set you do, think of it as an investment. Okay, I can get some protein synthesis out of it. But I'm also going to increase protein breakdown. So steering on a more tolerable level as opposed to I'm just going to do 10 sets or I'm going to do 15 or I'm going to do 20. Just remember every single set. Think about it strategically. What am I getting mm. out of it in terms of potential anabolic signaling? And what is it costing me in terms of protein breakdown? And your goal at the end of the day, regardless of what kind of athlete you are, if you want to change your body, is you got to make protein synthesis outweigh protein breakdown as much as possible. So if you're doing, you know, more than one set, it can increase protein synthesis a little bit more. Um, yeah. But there is a plateau, you yeah. know, and we don't know where that plateau is. Is it two sets? Is it three sets? Is it four sets? You know, in the, in the rat study I referenced, it was at five sets. Yeah. But that was with three minute rest intervals. So what if you use longer rest intervals? What if you're yeah. more sufficiently warmed up? What if the set quality is better? You know, could it be, you know, just it might it might be two sets. We and that's kind of where I get where my training um, is. I do about two one to two sets per muscle twice a week for my kind of one to four set total per week, um, and and that's working extremely well. But it's, it's all about the delicate balance of protein synthesis and protein breakdown. And throughout your workout, I discussed this in my hypertrophy course, you just got to interpret resistance training as a signal. It's a signal to change the activity of proteins inside of your muscle cell. When you kind of look at it on a cellular level and understand it on a cellular level, then your strategy is going to change in terms of uh, how much volume you're doing and what the purpose of that volume is. And you're, you're thinking about it from a cell signaling standpoint. And when you start thinking about it and conceptualizing it like that, like, okay, what is this doing inside of my muscle cells? I think it once again is going to drive people to lower volume um, because when you couple the cell signaling knowledge with the practical fact that, okay, I got to consistently get stronger, I think it's naturally just going to steer people um, towards lower volume. And uh, again, I'm not anti-volume, but it's just, what is optimal to make protein yeah. synthesis 
outweigh protein breakdown as much as possible in combination with the effects of seeing strength increase uh, yeah. significantly on hopefully, you know, week to week or biweekly or monthly basis. Yeah. No, that's a great way of putting it, man. It's like, yeah, you, you probably get a little bit more out of doing more than one set. In theory, can yeah. you make progress with one set if the effort is there and the intensity is there? Sure, but you'll probably get a little bit more if you do three to five. Now, if you do three to five really freaking hard, maybe some people could do more. Most people could probably handle around that and make really good progress. So I, I love this conversation because it really, like, I know a lot of people talk about uh, on your posts and stuff, like you're anti-volume and like you're saying like volume doesn't matter. And that's not true, right? It's like you're, maybe the, the point that you're trying to assess is like the amount of volume that's being recommended is just too much to progress optimally and people can't handle that amount of volume, right? And a lower amount of volume may be better. Yeah, um, and from a signaling standpoint, the lower amount of volume can get the job done. Yeah. You know, from strictly a cell signaling standpoint, like, hey, it's documented that it could work. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. And obviously, I'm not well versed in the cell signaling mechanisms of hypertrophy nearly as much as you are. But I take your word for it because I know you're a smart guy. So question for you. Since you've transitioned to a lower volume, because I haven't seen you in some time, man, would you see you've made really good progress and packed on a good amount more uh, muscle compared to when you were in, in graduate school and you used to do about 10 sets or so per muscle? Oh, yeah. And I'm feeling just much more fresh. Yeah. Like the strength is not going to lie to you. You know, there's yeah. there's no time where you're going to go into a gym and you're going to see somebody just moving a, a crazy amount of weight in the six to 12 rep range across various exercises. And that's going to be a small person. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So if you can move a lot of weight in the, you know, six to 12, four to 16 rep range, a thick rep range uh, on a, a decent variety of exercises, that's going to be a very large humor. Yeah. Um, and since I've you know, seen you last, it's, it's been a hot minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely improved in terms of my physique. Yeah. And when you gain strength, when you gain muscle, you're going to see, you know, curves in the right places. You're going to have rounder muscle bellies. You're going to be fuller. Um, so I, I think that it's definitely seen some dramatic progress switching to this, this low volume approach and, and technique. Yeah, that's, that's a great explanation, man. Last thing I want to talk about here, and it's the interplay between training and nutrition. Okay. Cause yeah. I love talking about nutrition. Obviously I talk a lot about different health related topics, um, when it comes to preventing disease, adiposity, et cetera, but nutrition for muscle growth specifically, um, how, well, maybe you have a different view than I do, but I would say how over-exaggerated is it that you need to be consistently gaining a considerable amount of weight to build muscle? Is that true? Um, is that not true? So I love, I love looking at things from the cellular perspective. So what do we need to grow muscle? Um, we need to stimulate protein synthesis. So we need that signal. Resistance training provides it. And then in terms of the raw materials, what do we need? We need amino acids. You know, you can't build protein chains if you don't have the, the building blocks. You don't have the amino acids. You can't build a house if you don't have bricks. Um, and then you also need energy. You need energy to lay those bricks and assemble those bricks to build that house. You need energy in the form of glucose, provides ATP, or fatty acids. So in terms of, oh, I got to bulk to gain a lot of weight. I got to, you know, um, you know, go to Domino's every Thursday and get that carry out pizza for seven ninety nine, like I used to do and get super fat. I got to like two eighty once. Um, not a good time. Uh, but you don't need any of that. You need amino acids and you need energy. So if you're really, really good about your nutrient timing, or if you got just a little bit of body fat, um, I feel like you can grow sufficiently. And, and there's been numerous, or not numerous, but a few studies that have documented where you overfeed, you're really not going to increase your rate of muscle growth. You're just going to add more body fat. So I feel yeah. like every calorie you eat when you're trying to gain muscle, it's kind of like an investment. And there gets to a point where there's just such diminishing returns. If you mm -hmm. have you know, a moderate or high level of body fat where you do not need to keep force feeding yourself. Mm -hmm. food. And I think that's, that's a good sign alone. If you're force feeding, okay, time to pull yeah. back. Uh, I recently got to about 6,000 calories <sighs> and I was like, Ooh, food was not getting fun. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I pulled back a little. Um, and I'm still making some, some steady strength gains, which tells me I'm keep, 
consistently yeah. building muscle on about 4,500 calories, significantly less. And I'm kind of recomping, but my strength again, is just continuing to climb. So that tells me I'm eating enough protein and then I have sufficient energy, um, from the food that I'm eating. And also I probably got a little bit chunky. I probably had some yeah. excess body fat that was, you know, being broken down moved into my bloodstream and then going into my muscle cells to fuel the growth. So you don't need to get into an eating contest with yourself to yeah. build muscle. And I wish my younger self never got to 280 um, and never did that because you just, it's not necessary yeah. to get overly fat to build muscle. And I feel like, well, again, that's so overblown on social media, yeah. bulk life. Yeah. Maybe not even overly fat, but you know, you mentioned the idea of body recomp and perhaps recomping is actually possible for a larger percentage of the population than most people think, right? Because it just makes sense physiologically. If you're providing the stimulus, you're providing the nutrients that your body should be able to metabolize body fat to use that energy to achieve a certain degree of body recomp. And unless you are really lean, um, you can probably build a good amount of muscle staying around maintenance, maybe even a very slight surplus, right? Um, like myself personally, I'm probably, I would guess maybe 17, 18% body fat. Um, I have very light ab definition, but I definitely don't have a six pack. Uh, I've, it's hard, man, because I think perhaps maybe I'm after this conversation doing a little bit too much work because I'm, I'm thinking here about like my own arousal with training. And after about three or four weeks of training, like workouts just become much more of a chore. Right. And it's just a lot harder to like actually push with the same intensity and arousal compared to when, when I'm fresher at the beginning of a mesocycle, like always way more enjoyable, push way harder. And it's funny because there's a lot of enjoyment there. And I'm like, this is going really well. It's going to go even better because I'm doing a little bit more. And then it just like hits a wall really quick. Um, so body composition hasn't changed a tremendous amount, uh, even though weight has been fairly similar. I will say I went through about like a year and a half bulk and it wasn't consistent. Like some months I gained a little bit more weight than others, but on average I gained about a pound a month. And I still think that was too fast because when I got to my peak weight, like I put on more body fat than I'd like, and I did get stronger. I did get substantially stronger, but I don't think it was at a good ratio relative to the amount of body fat I put on. Now, I know it also depends on individual genetics and lifestyle and all of these other factors. I try to control a lot of the lifestyle based things as much as I can. But sometimes I think like, should I even really try to gain weight? Like, is it even necessary? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I am, I'm pro nutrient timing. So we talked about a little bit in the beginning, the differences in cell signaling from a beginner and advanced lifter, that first six hours, regardless of who you are, regardless of your, this is your first time you're lifting weights or you've been doing it 10 years, that first six hours post-workout, you're so sensitive to grow. And I think a good backload of calories during that highly sensitive time, that more aggressive anabolic window could be extremely advantageous. Um, to sort of give your body the necessary calories. Cause most of the time growth is not limited by the amount of protein you're eating, but rather the amount of energy you have available to link those amino acids together. So yeah. I think when you're highly sensitive to grow post-workout, um, stack those calories and do not be afraid to eat. But then when it's further away from your workout, you know, okay, I haven't trained in 20 hours or maybe I'm taking a rest day. I haven't trained in 40 hours. Drop those calories a little lower, you know, yeah. try to keep the face a little slimmer. Don't get as much moon face. Like I, I happen to get, <laughs> After that 6,000 calorie mark. Yeah. Um, but I think nutrient timing is paramount. And then post-workout, when you're highly sensitive to grow, do not be afraid to eat. Uh, and if you train super late, you know, let's say you're training at 9 p.m. and you're going to bed at 10 p.m., then that 10 p.m. meal better be pretty big if you want to make uh, yeah. uh, the most advantageous, most efficient transformation. Because you don't have a lot of time to get calories in before you're not going to eat again for another eight hours or so when totally. you're sleeping that first six hours don't be afraid to push those calories but then you know 20 hours 30 hours 40 hours away from a workout you know if you're having a rest day um yeah pull back it's okay to pull back you don't have to commit carbicide every meal and i feel like that's a that's a great balance to to steadily recomp and i think you can recomp uh irrespective of your training experience you know i'm yeah over a decade in the game and I feel like I'm recomping right now. 
It's just a matter of the re the stimulus, the resistance training, and the resources, the amino acids, the fatty acids, your fat, and your glucose, so your carbs, fats, and proteins in terms of your resources. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, I think we go ahead and wrap this up here. We've been talking for quite some time. Honestly, I could talk about this forever, but I'm going to have some lunch now. I'm going to get ready. I'm recording another one of these in about an hour, but I appreciate you a ton, Chester. Um, I'm happy we got to catch up, man. Uh, I miss you and I being in the lab and talking shit back and forth. <laughs> yeah. um, if people go want dogs. to, sorry, I hit that go dogs in the photo. I don't know if you can see that right. There. Oh man. got to talk a whole bunch of shit. Cause you know, we're going to beat you guys in the playoffs. It's going to yeah. be great. Looking forward to it. Y'all going to get the four seed. We're going to get the one seed. It's all good. Yeah, this episode might not be published if you keep talking shit. <laughs> <laughs> all jokes aside, man, I appreciate you a ton. Um, would you mind sharing with the audience where they can find you if they want to connect with you as well as, where they can find your app and your course. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the and best I'll, I'll link everything in the description. So don't worry about okay. like, uh, spelling. The best place is my Instagram, Dr. Soko. Um, my app is called the physique lab and it serves as a workout journal. It's also going to get training programs very soon. So if you want to, if you're curious about that, you know, Oh my God, one to four sets per week. If you're curious about that style of training uh, and I do train, um, some clients with a little bit higher volume, um, but if you're curious about that, the app is going to have training programs soon. And then I also have a hypertrophy course called Physique U where I talk about all these topics um, in much more depth, intensity, volume, frequency, mind, muscle connection, reps and reserve, training to failure, um, all the things that you're going to need to understand exactly how to transform your body in the fastest, most efficient way possible and do so on top of good health rather than at the expense of good health. That is at my website, Physique U. Um, but again, Instagram, Dr. Soko, y'all could just call me Chester. Um, that's going to be the best place to connect if you have any further questions. Awesome, dude. Appreciate you. Have a wonderful day, man. You too, Brody.